Uh, in this case, we have a network which has an input on the left-hand side. Uh, usually, you have the input on the bottom side or on the left. Uh, they are pink in my slides, so if you take nodes, make them pink. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, and then we have, what, how many activations? How many hidden layers do you count there? Four hidden layers. So overall, how many layers does the network have here? Six, right? Because we have four hidden plus one input plus one output layer. Uh, so in this case, I have two neurons per layer, right? So what does it mean? How, what are the dimensions of the matrices we are using here? Two by two. So what does a two by two matrix does? Come on, you have, you know the answer to this question. Rotation, yeah, then? Scaling, then? Sharing, and? Reflection. Reflection, fantastic, right? So we constrain our network to perform all the operations on the plane. We have seen the first time, if I uh, allow the, the hidden layer to be uh, 100 neurons long, we can, wow, okay, we can easily, we can easily. Thanks. and I are from mine. Ah, fantastic, what is it? Uh, we are watching movies now, I see. Uh, see, fantastic. What is it? Mandalorian. It's so cool, huh? Okay. Okay. How nice is this lesson is even recorded. Okay, we have no idea. Okay, give me a sec. Okay, so we go here. Done. Uh, this one. All right, so we started from this network here, right? Which we had this uh, intermediate layer and we forced them to be uh, two-dimensional, right? Such that all the transformations are enforced to be on a plane. So this is what the network does to our plane. It folds it on specific regions, right? And those foldies, fold, folding are very, very abrupt. This is because all the transformations are performed in the 2D layer, right? So this training, took me really, really a lot of effort because the optimization is actually quite hard. Uh, whenever I had the 100 neuron inter, uh, hidden layer, that was very, very easy to train. This one really, really took a lot of effort, and you had to tell me why, okay? Uh, if you don't know the answer right now, better you know the answer for the midterm. So you can take note of what are the questions in the midterm. Right, so this is the final uh, output of the network, which is also that uh, 2D layer uh, to the embedding, so I have no nonlinearity uh, on my last layer. And these are the final uh, classification regions. So let's see what each layer does. This is the first layer, a fine transformation. So it looks like a, it's a 3D rotation, but it's not, right? It's just a 2D rotation, uh, reflection, scaling, and shearing. And then what is this part? Ah, what's happened right now? Do you see? All we had like the relu part, which is killing all the negative uh, um, sides of the network, right? All the, sorry, all, all the negative sides of this uh, space, right? This is the uh, second affine transformation. And then here you apply again uh, the relu. You can see all the negative uh, subspaces have been erased and they've been set to zero. Then we keep going with the third affine transformation. Is zoom, it, zoom in a lot. And then, again, you're going to have now the redo layer, which is going to be killing one of those, uh, all the f uh, three quadrants, right? Only one quadrant survives every time. And then we go with the fourth affine transformation, where it's elongating a lot, because, uh, again, given that we confine all the transformation to be living in the space, it really needs to stretch and, you know, use all the uh, power it can, right? Again, this is the uh, second last. Then we have the last affine transformation, which is the final one, and then we reach, finally, uh, linearly separable uh, regions here. Finally, we're going to see how each affine transformation can be uh, uh, split in its components. So we have rotation. We have now squashing, like uh, zooming. Then we have rotation, reflection, because the determinant is minus 1. And then we have the final bias. Again, you have the positive part of the real rectify linear unit. Again, rotation, uh, flipping, because, again, we had a negative a minus one determinant, uh, zoom in, rotation, uh, one more reflection, and then the final bias. This was the second affine transformation, then we have here the positive part. Again, we are third layer, so rotation, reflection, uh, zooming, and then we have the, uh, this is SVD decomposition, right? You should be uh, 
aware of that, right? You should know. And then the final is the translation, and again, the third uh, ReLU. Then we had the fourth layer, so rotation, reflection, because the determinant was negative, uh, zooming, again, the other rotation. I go on some more rota uh, reflection, and the bias. Finally, ReLU, and then we had the last, uh, the, the fifth layer. So rotation, zooming, we didn't have reflection because the determinant was plus one. Again, reflection in this case because the determinant was negative, and then finally the final bias, right? And so this was uh, pretty much how this network, which was uh, just made of uh, a sequence of layers of uh, neurons that are only two neurons per layer, is being performing the classification task. Uh, and all those transformations have been constrained to be uh, living on the, on, the, uh, on the plane, okay? So this was really, really hard to train. Can you figure out why it was really, really hard to train? What does it happen if my, uh, if my bias of one of the five layers put my points in, uh, away from the top right quadrant? The activation would become zero. Exactly. So if you have one of the four biases putting my uh, initial point away from the top right quadrant, then the relus are going to be completely killing everything, and everything gets collapsed into zero. Okay? And so there, you can't do any more anything, right? So uh, this network here was really hard, again, to train. If you just make it a little bit fatter, then instead of constraining it to be uh, two neurons for each of the hidden layer, then it's much easier to train. Or you can do a combination of the two, right? So instead of having just a fat network, you can have a network that is less fat, but then you have a few... Uh, hidden layers, okay? So that was pretty much, yeah, question. Um, so the fatness is how many uh, neurons you have per hidden layer, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. So the question is that how do we determine the structure or the uh, configuration of our network, right? How do we design network? Uh, and the answer is going to be, uh, that's what Jan is going to be teaching across the semester, right? So keep, in, keep, 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 it like, keep your attention high because, you know, that's what we are going to be teaching here. Uh, that's a good question, right? We, there, is, there is no, like, uh, mathematical rule. Like, there is a lot of experimental uh, empirical evidence. And, you know, a lot of people trying different configurations. We found something that actually works pretty well now. Again, we're going to be covering these architectures in the following lessons. Other questions? Don't be shy. No? Okay. So I guess then we can switch the, so the second part of the class. Okay, so we're going to talk about convolutional nets today, um, and let's dive right in. So I'll start with uh, something that's relevant to convolutional nets, but not just, which is the idea of transforming the parameters of a neural net. So here we have a diagram that we've seen before, except with a small twist. Uh, the diagram we're seeing here is that we have a neural net, G, of x and w, w being the parameters, x being the input that you know makes a prediction about an output and that goes into a cost function. We've seen this before. But the twist here is that the weight vector, instead of uh, being a, a parameter that's being optimized, is actually itself the output of some other function, possibly parameterized. In this case, this function is uh, not a parameterized function, or it's a parameterized function, but the only input is another parameter u. Okay, so essentially, uh, what we've done here is made the weights of that neural net a function of some more elementary, some more elementary parameters u through a function. And uh, you, you realize really quickly that backprop just works there, right? If you backpropagate gradients uh, uh, for, you know, through the, the g function to get the gradient of whatever objective function you're minimizing with respect to the weight parameters, you can keep backpropagating through the h function here to get the gradients with respect to u. Uh, so in the end, uh, you're sort of, uh, you know, propagating things uh, like, like this. So uh, when you're updating u, you're multiplying the Jacobian of the objective function with respect to the parameters, and then by the... Uh, Jacobian of the H function with respect to its own parameters. Okay, so you get the product of two Jacobians here, which is the just what you get from backpropagating. You don't have to do anything in PyTorch for this. This will happen automatically as you define the network. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's kind of the, the update that, uh, that occurs. Now, of course, 
uh, w being uh, a function of u through the function h, the, the change in w will, uh, will be the change in u multiplied by the Jacobian of h transpose. And so this is the kind of uh, thing you get here. Uh, the effective change in w that you get without updating w, you're actually updating u. Uh, is the uh, update in u multiplied by the Jacobian of h. Uh, and, you know, we had a transpose here. We don't, we have the, the opposite there. This is a square uh, matrix, which is nw by nw, which is the number of the dimension of w squared, okay? So this matrix here uh, has as many rows as uh, w has components. And then the number of columns is the number of uh, components of u. And then this guy, of course, is the other way around. So it's NU by NW. So when you make the product, do the product of those two matrices, you get an NW by NW matrix. Um, and then you multiply this by this uh, NW vector, and you get an NW vector, which, which is what you need for updating uh, the, the weights. OK, so that's a kind of a general form of transforming the parameter space. And there is uh, you know, many ways you can use this. And a particular way of using it is when uh, H is uh, what's called a, you know, what we talked about last week, which is a, a sort of Y connector. So imagine the only thing that H does is that it takes one component of U and it copies it multiple times so that you have the same value, the same weight replicated across the G function. Uh, the G function will use the same value multiple times. Um, so this, is, this would look like this. Uh, so let's imagine U is two-dimensional, uh, U1, U2. And then w is four-dimensional, but uh, w1 and w2 are equal to u1, and w3, uh, w4 are equal to u2. Uh, so basically, you only have two free parameters, and when you're changing one component of u, you're changing two components of w at the same time uh, in a very simple manner. And that's called uh, weight sharing, okay? When two weights are forced to be equal, they actually are they're actually equal to a more elementary parameter that controls both. That's weight sharing. And that's kind of the basis of uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, ideas, and, you know, convolutional nets among others. But uh, but but that that you can think of this as a very very simple form of uh, H of U. So um, again, you don't need to do anything for this uh, in the sense that when you have weight sharing, um, if you do it explicitly with a module that does kind of a Y connection on the way back, when the gradients are back propagated, the, the gradients are summed up. So the gradient of some cost function with respect to u1, for example, would be the sum of the gradients of that cost function with respect to w1 and w2. And similarly for the gradient with respect to u2 would be the sum of the gradients with respect to w3 and w4. Okay? That's just the effect of backpropagating through the two y connectors. Um, Okay, here's a slightly more general uh, view of this parameter transformation here that some people have called hypernetworks. So a hypernetwork is uh, a network where the weights of one network are computed as the output of another network, okay? So you have a network H that looks at uh, the input. It has its own parameters, U, um, and it computes the weights of a second network, okay? And so the uh, advantage of, of doing this uh, and this various name for it. The uh, idea is very old. It goes back to the 80s. Uh, people are using what's called multiplicative interactions or three-way network or sigma pi units. And they're basically uh, this idea, and this is may maybe a, a slightly more general, general formulation of it, that uh, uh, you, you have sort of a dynamically, uh, you know, a function that's kind of dy dynamically defined uh, in, in uh, uh, G of X and W. Uh, because W is really a complex function of the input and some other parameter. Um, this is particularly uh, interesting architecture when what you're, doing, what, what you're doing to X is transforming it in some ways. Right? So the, you can think of W as being the parameters of that transformation. So Y would be a transformed version of X. Uh, and, uh, and the X, uh, I mean the, the function H basically computes that transformation. Okay, but we'll come back to that um, in a few weeks. Um, just wanted to mention this because it's basically a small modification of, uh, of this, right? You just have one more wire that goes from X to H, and that's how you get those hypernetworks. Okay, so weight sharing, that's uh, you know, the idea that you can uh, have one parameter uh, controlling 
multiple pro multiple pro effective parameters in another network. And one reason that's useful is uh, if you want to detect a motif on, a, on an input, and you want to detect this motif regardless of where it appears. Okay, so let's say you have an input, let's say it's a sequence, but it could be equal to be an image. In this case, it's a sequence. Sequence of vectors, let's say. And you have a network that takes uh, a collection of three of those vectors, three successive vectors. Uh, it's this network G of X and W. And it's trained to detect a particular motif of those three vectors. Maybe this is, I don't know, the uh, power consumption, electric, electrical power consumption. And sometimes, you know, you might want to be able to detect like a, a blip or a trend or something like that. Or maybe it's, you know, uh, uh, financial instruments of some kind. Um, some sort of time series. Maybe it's a speech signal and you want to detect a particular sound that consists in three vectors that define the, the, the sort of audio content of that, uh, of that speech signal. Um, and so you'd like to be able to detect uh, if it's a speech signal and there's a particular sound you, you need to detect for doing speech recognition, you might want to detect, you know, the sound, uh, the, the, the vowel P, right? The, the sound P, wh wherever it occurs in the sequence, you want, some, you know, some detector that fires when the sound P is, um, uh, is, is pronounced. And so what you'd like to have is a detector that you can, you can slide over, right? And regardless of where this motif occurs, uh, detect it. So what you need to have is some, some networks and parameterized function that, you know, you have multiple copies of that function that you can apply to various uh, regions on the input, and they all share the same weight. But you'd like to train this entire system end-to-end. -end. So for example, um, let's say, uh, let's talk about a slightly more sophisticated um, uh, uh, scene here where you have, uh, let's see, uh, a keyword that's being being pronounced. So the the system listens to sound and wants to detect when a particular keyword, a wake up uh, word has been uh, has been pronounced, right? So this is Alexa, right? And you say Alexa, and Alexa wakes up. It goes bong, right? Uh, so what you like to have is you know some network that kind of takes a, a window over the sound and then sort of keeps uh, you know in the background sort of detecting. But you'd like to be able to detect, you know, wherever the sound occurs within the frame that is being looked at, who's being listened to, I should say. So you could have a network like this where you have, you know, replicated detectors, they all share the same weight, and then the output, which is, you know, a score as to whether something has been detected or not, goes to a max function, okay, and that's the output. And the way you train a system like this, um, you know, you would have a bunch of samples, uh, uh, audio uh, examples where the, the keyword uh, has been pronounced, and a bunch of audio samples where the keyword was not pronounced, and then you train a, a two-class classifier, turn on when Alexa is somewhere in this frame, turn off when it's not. But nobody tells you where the word Alexa occurs within the, the window that you train the system on. Okay, because it's really expensive for labelers to like look at the audio signal and tell you exactly where well, this is the word is Alexa is being pronounced. The only thing they know is that you know within this segment of a few seconds the word has been has been pronounced somewhere. Okay, so you'd like to apply a network like this that has those replicated detectors. You don't know exactly where it is, but you run through this max and you want to train the system to uh, you know you want to backpropagate gradient to it so that it learns to detect you know Alexa or whatever. Uh, wake up word uh, occurs. And so there, what, what happens is you have those multiple copies, five copies in this, uh, in this example of this network, and they all share the same weight. And you can see this as just one weight vector sending its value to five different uh, instances of the same network. And so when you backpropagate, backpropagate through, the, through the, the five copies of the network, you get five gradients, and those gradients get added up. Uh, for the parameter. Now, this is a slightly strange way this is implemented in PyTorch and other uh, deep learning framework, which is that this accumulation of gradient in a single parameter is done implicitly. And it's one reason why, before you do a backprop in PyTorch, you have to zero out the gradient. Um, because there's sort of implicit uh, accumulation of gradients when you do backpropagation. Okay, so here's another situation where that would be useful, and this is 
for really the real motivation behind convolutional nets in the first place, uh, which is the, the problem of uh, training a, a system to recognize a shape independently of the position of whether the shape occurs uh, and whether there are distortions of that shape uh, in the input. So here, uh, this is a very simple type of convolutional net that is, has been built by hand. It's not been trained. Okay? It's been designed by hand. Uh, and it's designed explicitly to distinguish uh, C's from D's. Okay, so you can draw a C on the input uh, image, which is you know very low resolution. And what distinguishes C's from D's is that C's have uh, endpoints, right? There's the the stroke kind of ends. And you can imagine designing a detector for that. Whereas D's have corners. So if you have a, an endpoint detector, something that detects the end of a segment, and a corner detector. Wherever you have corners that are detected, it's a C, it's a D, and whatever, wherever you have uh, segments that end, it's a C. So here's an example of, uh, of a C. You take the first detector, so the, the little uh, black and white motif here at the top uh, is, a, is an endpoint detector, okay? It's, uh, it detects the end of a, uh, of a segment, and the way this, uh, this is uh, represented here is that the, the black pixels here, um, so think of this as some sort of template. Okay, you're going to take this template and you're going to swipe it over the input image. And you're going to compare that template to the little image that is placed underneath. Okay? And if those two match, the way you're going to determine whether they match is that you're going to do a dot product. So you're going to think of those black and white pixels as value of plus one or minus one, say plus one for black, minus one for, for white. And you're going to think of those pixels also as being plus one for black and minus one for white. And when you compute the dot product of a little uh, window with that template, if they are similar, you're going, to, you're going to get a large positive value. If they're dissimilar, you're going to get a, a zero or a negative value or a smaller value. Okay. So you take that little detector here, and you compute the dot product with the first window, second window, third window, etc. You shift by one pixel every time for every location, and you record the result. And what you, what you get is this, right? So this is here the, the grayscale uh, is an indication of the uh, matching, uh, which is actually the dot product, between the, the vector formed by those values and the vec and the, the the patch at the corresponding location on the input. So this image here is roughly the same size as that image, uh, minus border effects. And which is, you see there is a, whenever the output is dark, there is a match. So you see a match here, uh, because this endpoint detector here matches the, you know, the endpoint. Uh, you see sort of a match here at the bottom. And, and the other kind of values are not as uh, dark, okay? Not as strong, if you want. Now, if you threshold those, those values, you set the output to plus one if, uh, if it's above the threshold uh, uh, zero. If it's below the threshold, you get those maps. You have to adapt the threshold appropriately. But what you get is that, you know, this little guy here detected a match at the two endpoints of the C. Okay, so now if you take this map, you sum, him, sum it up. Uh, just add all the values. Uh, you get a positive number, pass that through the threshold, and that's your C detector. It's not a very good C detector. It's not a very good detector of anything, but for those particular examples of Cs and maybe those Ds, uh, it will work. it will be enough. Now, for the D, it's similar. Those other detectors here are meant to detect the corners of the D. Right? So this guy here, this detector, as you swipe it over the, uh, the input, will, will detect the... Uh, upper uh, left corner, and that guy will detect the lower right corner. Once you threshold, you will get those two maps where the corners are detected. Uh, and then you can sum those up, and the, the, the D detector will turn on. Now, what you see here is an example of why this is good, because uh, that detection now is shift invariant. So if I take the same input D here, and I shift it by a, a couple pixels, um, and I run this detector again, it will detect the motif wherever they appear. The output will be shifted, okay? So this is called equivariance to shift. So the output of that network 
um, is equivalent to shift, which means that if I shift the input, the output gets shifted, but otherwise unchanged. Okay, that's, that's equivariance. Invariance would be if I shifted the input, the output would be completely unchanged. But here, it is modified. It just modified the same way as the input. Um, and so if I just sum up the, activa the activities in the feature maps here, it doesn't matter wh where they occur. Uh, my D detector will still, will still um, activate right? if I just compute the sum. So this is sort of a handcrafted uh, pattern recognizer that use, uses local feature detectors and then kind of sums up their activity, and what you get is an invariant detection. Okay? This is a fairly classical way, actually, of building certain types of pattern recognition systems uh, going back many years. Um, but the trick here, what's important, of course, what's interesting would be to learn those, those, those templates. You know, can we... Uh, you know, can we view this as just a, a neural net and we backpropagate to it and we learn those templates um, as, as weights of a, of a neural net? You know, after all, we're using them to do dot product, which are weighted sums. So, you know, basically the, <clears throat> this, uh, this layer here to go from the input to those so-called feature maps that are weighted sums uh, is a linear operation. Okay, and we know how to backpropagate to that. Uh, we'd have to use, you know, a, a kind of a soft threshold or value or something like this here, because otherwise we can do backprop. Okay, so this operation here of taking the dot product of a bunch of coefficients uh, with uh, an input window and then swiping it over, that's a convolution. Okay, so that's the definition of a convolution. It's actually the one up, up, up there. So this is in the one-dimensional uh, case where uh, imagine you have uh, uh, an input xj, so x indexed by the j uh, ind index. Um, you take a window uh, of x at a particular location i, okay? And then you sum, you do a weighted sum of a little window of the x values, and you multiply those by the weights, wj's. Okay, and the sum presumably runs over a kind of a small, uh, a small window. So j here would go from 1 to, I don't know, 5, something like that, which is the case in the little example I showed earlier. Um, okay, and that gives you 1 yi. Okay, so take the first window of five values of x, compute the weighted sum with the weights, that gives you y1. Then shift that window by one, compute the weighted sum of or the dot product of that window by the w's, that gives you y2, shift again, etc. Okay? Now, in fact, in practice, what people implement in things like PyTorch, there is a confusion between two things that mathematicians think are very different, but in fact, they're pretty much the same. It's convolution and cross-correlation. So in convolution, the convention is that the, uh, the uh, index goes backwards in the, in the window when it goes forwards in the weights. In cross-correlation, they, they both go forward. In the end, it's just a convention. You know, it depends on how you lay, you know, lay, uh, uh, organize the, the data in your weights. You can interpret this as a convolution if you read the weights backwards. Um, so it really doesn't make any difference. Um, but for certain mathematical properties of convolution, if you want everything to be consistent, you, you, you have to have the, the j in the w having an opposite sign to the j in the x. So the two-dimensional version of this, uh, if you have an image uh, x that has two indices, in this case i and j, uh, you do a weighted sum over two indices, k and l, and so you have a window, a two-dimensional window indexed by k and l, and you compute the dot product of that window over x with the, the weights, and that gives you one value in uh, yij, which is the, uh, the output. So the, the vector w, or the matrix w in the, in the 2D version, there is obvious extensions of this to 3D and 4D, et cetera. Uh, it's called a kernel. It's called a convolution kernel. Is that clear? 
I'm sure this is known for many of you, but... Um, <clears throat> so, what we're going to do with this is that uh, we're going to organize, you know, build a network as a succession of uh, convolutions where, where, you know, in a regular neural net you have uh, alternation of linear operators and pointwise nonlinearity. In convolutional nets, we're going to have an alternation of linear operators that ha will happen to be convolutions or multiple convolutions, then also pointwise nonlinearity, and there's going to be a, a third type of operation called pooling, um, which is actually optional. Before, uh, before I go further, uh, I should mention that there are uh, twists you can make to this convolution. So one twist is what's called a stride. So a stride in a convolution consists in moving the window from one, uh, you know, from one position to another. Instead of moving it, moving it by just one value, you move it by two or three or four. Okay, that's called a stride of a convolution. And so if you have an input of a certain length, and uh, so let's say you have an input um, which is kind of a one-dimensional and of size 100, and you have a convolution uh, kernel of size 5, okay, and you convolve the, this kernel with the input, uh, and you make sure that the window stays within the input of size 100, the output you get has 96 outputs, okay? It's got the number of inputs minus the size of the kernel, which is 5, minus 1, okay? So that makes it 4. So you get 100 minus 4, that's 96. That's the number of, you know, windows of size 5 that fit within this uh, big input of size 100. Um, now, if I use a stride, so what I do now is uh, I take my window of 5, where I apply the kernel, and I shift it not by 1 pixel, but by 2 pixels, or 2 values, let's say. They're not necessarily pixels. Okay, the number of outputs I'm going to get is going to be, you know, divided by, by 2, roughly. Okay? Instead of 96, I'm going to have, you know, a little less than 50, you know, 48 or something like that. The number is not exact. You can figure out in your head. Um, very often when people run convolutions in convolutional nets, they actually pad the convolution. So they sometimes like to have the output being the same size as the input. And so they actually displace the input window past the end of the vector, assuming that it's padded with zeros, usually on both sides. Uh, does it have any effect on performance or is it just for convenience? If it has an effect on performance, it's bad, okay? But it is convenient. <laughs> That's pretty much the answer. Um, the, the assumption that's bad is assuming that when you don't have data, it's equal to zero. So when your nonlinearities are value, it's not necessarily completely unreasonable. Uh, but it sometimes creates like funny border effects, you know, boundary effects. Okay, everything clear so far? Right. Okay, so what we're going to build is uh, a, a neural net composed of those uh, convolutions that are going to be used as, as feature detectors, local feature detectors, followed by nonlinearities, and then we're going to stack multiple layers of those. Okay, and the reason for stacking multiple layers is because uh, we want to build hierarchical representations of the of the visual world of the data. It's not convolutional nets are not necessarily applied to images. They can be applied to speech and other signals. They basically can be applied to any signal that comes to you in the form of an array. Uh, and I'll come back to on to the the, the properties that this array has to verify. Um, so what you want is, uh, why do you want to build hierarchical representations? Because the, the world is, is compositional, and I alluded to this, I think, in the first lecture, if I remember correctly. It's the fact that, uh, you know, pixels, um, 
assemble to form simple motifs like oriented edges. Oriented edges kind of assemble to form local features like corners and T-junctions and things like that, gratings, you know. And then those assemble to form motifs that are slightly more abstract, the, those assemble to form parts of objects, and those assemble to form objects. So there is this sort of natural compositional hierarchy in the natural world. And this natural compositional hierarchy in the natural world is not just because of perception, visual perception, uh, it's true at the physical level, right? Um, uh, you know, you start at the, at the lowest level of description, you know, you have uh, elementary particles and they form, you know, they clump to form less elementary particles and they clump to form atoms and they clump to form molecules and molecules clump to form materials and materials, you know, parts of objects and uh, parts of objects into objects and things like that, right? Um, or macromolecules or polymer, polymers, blah, blah, blah. And then you have this, uh, this natural compositional hierarchy. The world is built this way. And uh, it may be why the world is understandable, right? So there's this famous quote from uh, Einstein that says, the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that the world is comprehensible. And it seems like a conspiracy that we live in a world that we are able to comprehend. Uh, but we, we can't comprehend it because the world is compositional and, uh, you know, it happens to be easy to build brains in a compositional world that actually can interpret compositional world. Uh, it still seems like a conspiracy to me. Uh, so there's a, a famous quote from... Uh, uh, from a, well, not that famous, but somewhat famous from a, a statistician at Brown called uh, Stu Giman. And, and he says, you know, that sounds like a, like a conspiracy, like magic. Uh, but, you know, if, if the world were not compositional, we would need some, some even more magic to be able to understand it. And he, uh, the way he, he says this is uh, the world is compositional or there is a God. Um, you would need to appeal to superior powers if the world was not compositional to explain how we can understand it. Um, okay, so this idea of hierarchy uh, and local feature detection comes from biology. So the whole idea of convolutional nets comes from biology. It's been uh, uh, sort of inspired by biology. And what you see here on the, on the right is a diagram by uh, Simon Thorpe, uh, who is a psychophysicist and um, did some relatively famous experiments where he showed that the, the way we recognize everyday objects seems to be extremely fast. So if you show, um, you flash the image of an everyday object to a person and you flash uh, one of them every 100 milliseconds or so, you realize that the, the, uh, the time it takes for the person to identify in a long sequence whether there was a particular object, let's say a tiger, um, is about 100 milliseconds. So the time it takes our brain to interpret an image and recognize basic objects in them is about 100 milliseconds, a tenth of a second, right? And that's just about the time it takes for the nerve signal to propagate from the retina where you know images are formed on the in the eye to what's called a LGN lateral geniculate nucleus, which is a, a small you know piece of brain that basically does so contrast enhancement and gain control and things like that. Uh, and then that signal goes to the back of your brain V1, that's the primary visual cortex area uh, in humans. And then V2, which is very close to V1, there's a fold that sort of makes V1 sort of uh, right in front of, of V2, and there is lots of wires between them. Um, and then V4, and then the infrotemporal cortex, which is sort of on the side here. And that's where object categories are represented. So there are neurons in the infrotemporal infra cortex that represent, you know, general, generic object categories. Um, and, you know, people have done experiments with this where, uh, you know, epileptic patients uh, are in hospital and have their skull open because they, we need to locate the, look, uh, the pos exact position of the source of their uh, epilepsy uh, um, seizures. 
Um, and because they have electrodes on the surface of, the, of their brain, um, you can show them movies and then observe if a particular neuron turns on for particular movies, and you show them a movie with Jennifer Aniston, and there is this neuron that only turns on when Jennifer Aniston is there. Okay, it doesn't turn on for anything else, as far as we could tell. Okay, um, so you seem to have very selective neurons in the infotemporal cortex that react to a small number of categories. Um, there's a joke, kind of a running joke in neuroscience of a concept called the grandmother cell. So this is the, the one neuron in your infotemporal cortex that turns on when you see your grandmother, regardless of what position, what she's wearing, how far, whether it's a photo or not. Um, nobody really believes in this concept. What people believe in are distributed representation. So there is no such thing as, the grand, as a cell that just turns on for your grandmother. There are this collection of cells that turn on for various things, and they serve to represent you know, general categories. But the important thing is that they are invariant to position, size, illumination, all kinds of different things. And the, the, the real motivation behind uh, convolutional nets is to build um, neural nets that are invariant to irrelevant transformation of the inputs. Okay? You can still recognize a C, a D, or your grandmother, regardless of the position and, to some extent, the orientation, the style, etc. So this... Uh, idea that the signal only takes 100 milliseconds to go from the retina to the infotemporal cortex seems to suggest that if you count like the delay to go through every neuron or every uh, stage in that, uh, in that pathway, uh, there's barely enough time for a few spikes to get through. So there's no time for complex recurrent connection, you know, recurrent computation. It's basically a feedforward process. It's very fast. Okay, and we need it to be fast because that's a question of survival for us. There's a lot of for, for most animals, you know, you need to be able to recognize really quickly what, what, what's going on, particularly, uh, you know, fast-moving predators, or prey, for that matter. Um, so that kind of suggests the idea that, you know, we can do, perhaps we could come up with some sort of neural net architecture that is completely fit-forward and uh, still can do recognition. Um, the diagram on the right um, is uh, from Gallant and Van Essen. So this is a, a type of uh, sort of abstract conceptual diagram of the two pathways in the visual cortex. There is the ventral pathway and the dorsal pathway. The ventral pathway is, you know, basically the V1, V2, V4 IT hierarchy, which is sort of from the back of the brain and goes sort of to the bottom and, and to the side. And then the dorsal pathway kind of goes, you know, uh, through the top, also towards the infotemporal cortex. And there is this idea somehow that the ventral pathway is there to tell you what you're looking at, whereas the dorsal pathway basically identifies locations, uh, geometry, and motion. Okay? So there is a pathway for what and another pathway for where, if you want. And that seems fairly separate in the human or primate uh, visual cortex. And of course, there are interactions between them. So various people had the idea of kind of using, um, so wh where does that idea come from? There is uh, classic work in neuroscience from the late 50s, early 60s by Huber and Wiesel. They're on the picture here. Uh, they won the Nobel Prize for it, so it's really classic work. And what they showed um, with cats, basically by poking electrodes into cat brains, uh, is that um, neurons in the, in the cat brain uh, in V1 detect, uh, are only sensitive to a small area of the visual field, and they detect oriented edges, uh, contours, if you want, in that particular area. Okay? So the area to which a particular neuron is sensitive is called a receptive field. Uh, and you take a particular neuron, and you, you show it uh, kind of an oriented bar, if you want, that you rotate, and at one point, the neuron will, will fire and as the, for a particular angle. And as you move away from that angle, the activation of the neuron kind of uh, diminishes. Okay, so that's called orientation selective neurons. And Huber and Wiesel call those simple cells. If you move the bar a little bit, you go out of the receptive field, that neuron doesn't fire anymore, doesn't react to it, 
there's going to be another neuron almost exactly identical to it, just a little bit, you know, away from the first one that does exactly the same function. It will react to a slightly different receptive field, but with the same orientation. So you start getting this idea that you have local feature detectors that are positioned, replicated all over the visual field, which is basically this idea of uh, convolution. Okay. So those are called simple cells. And then uh, another idea that, uh, or, or discovery that uh, Huber and Weasel did is the, the idea of complex cell. So what a complex cell is, is another type of neuron that integrates the output of multiple simple cells within a certain area. Okay, so they will take different simple cells that all detect uh, contours at a particular orientation, edges at a particular orientation, and compute you know, an aggregate of, of those activations. It will either do a max or a sum or a sum of square or square root of sum of square, some sort of function that does not depend on the order of the arguments, okay? Let's say max for the sake of simplicity. So basically, the complex cell will turn on if any of the simple cells within its uh, uh, input group turns on. You see? Okay, so that complex cell will detect an edge at a particular orientation regardless of its position within that little region. So it builds a little bit of uh, shift invariance of the representation coming out of the complex cells with respect to small variation of positions of uh, features in the input. Um, so a gentleman by the name of uh, Kunihiko, Kunihiko Fukushima, uh, no real relationship with the nuclear power plant, uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, experimented with computer models that sort of implemented this idea of simple cell, complex cell. And he had the idea of sort of replicating this with multiple layers. So basically, uh, you know, the exercise he, he, he did was very similar to the one I showed uh, earlier here with this sort of handcrafted uh, feature detector. Uh, some of those feature detectors in his model were handcrafted, but some of them were learned. Uh, they were learned by an unsupervised method. They were, he didn't have backprop, right? Backprop didn't exist. So, I mean, it existed, but he didn't, it wasn't really popular and people, you know, didn't use it. So, um, so he, he trained those filters basically with something that amounts to a, a sort of clustering algorithm uh, a little bit. Um, and, you know, separately for each layer. Um, and so he would... Uh, uh, you know, train the filters for the first layer, train this with handwritten digits. He also had a data set of handwritten digits. Uh, and then feed this to complex cells that so we can, you know, pool the activity of simple cells together. And then that would consist, that would um, form the input to the, the next layer and it would, you know, repeat the same learning algorithm. His model of neuron was uh, very complicated. It was kind of inspired by biology. So he had separate inhibitory neurons. The, uh, the other neurons you know, only have positive weights and outgoing weights, etc. But he managed to get this thing to kind of work. Okay, not very well, but it sort of worked. Um, then uh, a few years later, uh, I basically kind of got inspired by similar architectures, but, um, but trained them supervised with backprop. Okay, so that's the, the genesis of convolutional nets, if you want. And then independently, more or less, uh, uh, Max Riesenhuber in Tommy Pojo's lab at the MIT kind of rediscovered this architecture also, but also didn't use backprop for some reason. He calls this HMAX. So this is sort of the early experiments uh, I did with convolutional nets when I was finishing my postdoc in University of Toronto in 1988, so that goes back a long time. Uh, and I was trying to figure out, you know, does this work better on the small data set? So if you have a tiny amount of data, you train a fully connected network or a linear network with just one layer, or a network with local connections but no shared weights, or compare this with uh, what was not yet called a convolutional net, where, where you have shared weights and, and local connections, which one works best? And it turned out that in terms of uh, generalization ability, which are the curves on the bottom left, the... Uh, which you see here, the, 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 top, the top curve here is uh, basically the baby convolutional net architecture, 
trained with a very simple data set of handwritten digits that were drawn with a mouse, right? We didn't have any way of collecting images, basically, um, at that time. Uh, and then if you have local connections without shared weights, it doesn't, you know, it works a little worse. And then if you have fully connected uh, uh, networks, it works worse. And if you have a linear network, it not only work, works worse, but, but it also overfits, it overtrains. Um, so the test error goes down after a while. And this was trained with 320, 320 tr uh, training samples, which is really, really small. Those networks had you know, on the order of 5,000 connections, 1,000 parameters. Uh, so this is, you know, a billion times smaller than what we do today. A million times, I would say. Um, and then I uh, finished my postdoc, I went to Bell Labs, and Bell Labs had, you know, slightly bigger computers, but what they had was a data set that came from the postal service. So they had zip codes from envelopes, and we built a data set out of those zip codes, and then train a slightly bigger neural net for three weeks um, and got really good results. So this, uh, this convolutional net uh, did not have separate convolution and pooling. It had uh, strided convolution. So convolutions where the window is shifted by more than one pixel. So that's, uh, uh, what's the result of this? The result of this is that the output map, when you do a convolution that where the stride is uh, is more than one, you get an output whose resolution is smaller than the input. And you see an example here. So here the, uh, the input is 16 by 16 pixels. That's what we could afford. Uh, the kernels are 5 by 5. But they are shifted by 2 pixels uh, every time. And so the, uh, um, the, the output here uh, is, uh, is smaller because of that. Okay, and then uh, one year later, this was the next generation uh, uh, convolutional net. This one had separate uh, convolutional pooling. So what is the pooling operation? At that time, the pooling operation was just another neuron, except that all the weights of that neuron were equal. Okay, so a, a pooling unit was basically a unit that computed an average of its inputs and then pass, added a uh, bias and then passed it to a nonlinearity, which in this case was a, a hyperbolic tangent function. Okay, all the nonlinearities in this network were hyperbolic tangents. At the time, that's what people were doing. Um, and uh, the pooling operation was uh, uh, performed by shifting the, the window over which you compute the, the aggregate of the output of the previous layer by, by two pixels, okay? So here, um, you get a 32 by 32 input, uh, input window. Convolve this with uh, filters that are five by five. Yeah, I should mention that a convolution kernel sometimes is also called a filter. Um, and so what you get here are uh, uh, outputs that are, uh, I guess, uh, minus four, so it's 28 by 28. Okay, and then there is uh, pooling, which uh, computes an average of pixels here over a two by two window, and then shifts that window by two. So how many such windows do you have? Um, since the image is uh, 28 by 28, you divide by two, it's 14 by 14. Okay, so those images uh, here are 14 by 14 pixels. Okay, and they're basically half the resolution as the, the previous window because of this stride. Okay, now it becomes interesting because what you want now is you want the next layer to detect combinations of features from the previous layer. And so uh, the way to do this is you have different convolution filters applied to each of those feature maps. Okay. And you sum them up. You sum the results of those four convolutions, and you pass the result to a nonlinearity, and that gives you one feature map of the next layer. So because those filters are 5 by 5, and those uh, images are 14 by 14, those guys are 10 by 10, okay, to not have border effects. So each of these feature maps, of which there are 16, if I'm 
remember correctly, uh, uses a different set of uh, kernels to convolve the, the previous layers. In fact, the, um, the, the connection pattern between the feature map the feature map at this layer and the feature map at the next layer are, is actually not full. So not every feature map is connected to every feature map. There's a particular scheme of uh, different combinations of feature map from the previous layer uh, forming, co combining to, uh, for feature maps at the next layer. And the reason for doing this is just to save computer time. We just could not afford to connect everything to everything. It would have taken twice the time to, to run or more. Nowadays, we're kind of forced, more or less, to actually have a complete connection between feature maps in a convolutional net uh, because of the way that multiple convolutions are implemented in GPUs, which is sad. And then the next layer up, so again, those maps are 10 by 10, those feature maps are 10 by 10. And the next layer up, um, again, is produced by pooling and subsampling by a factor of two. And so those are five by five. Okay, and then again, there is a five by five convolution here. But of course, you can't move the window five by five over a five by five image, so it looks like a full connection, but it's actually a convolution. Okay, and keep this in mind. But you basically just only one location. Okay, and those feature maps at the top here are really outputs, and so you have one spatial location because you you can only place one five by five window within a five by five image. And you have 10 of those feature maps, each of which corresponds to a category. So you train the system to classify digits from 0 to 9. You have 10 categories. <coughs> this is a little animation that I uh, borrowed from Andre Capati. Uh, spent the time to build this little, <laughs> nice little animation. Uh, which is the, to represent sort of multiple convolutions, right? So you have three feature maps here on the input, and you have six um, convolution kernels and two feature maps on the output. So here, the first group of three feature maps are convolved with the three input uh, of three kernels are convolved with the three input feature maps to produce the first group, the, the first uh, of the two feature maps, the, the green one at the top, Okay, uh, and then, and the animation stops. Okay, so this is the first group of three uh, kernels convolved with the three feature maps, and they produce the, the green map at the top, and then you switch to the second group of, uh, uh, of uh, convolution kernels, so you, co you convolve with the uh, three input feature maps to produce the, the map at the bottom. Okay, so that's uh, an example of... Uh, you have n feature map on the input, n feature map on the output, and n times m convolution kernels to get all combinations. Here's another animation, which I made a long time ago, um, that shows a convolutional net after it's been trained in action, uh, trying to recognize digits. And so what's interesting to look at here is you, you have uh, uh, an input here, which is, I believe, uh, 32 rows by 64 columns. And after doing six convolutions with six convolution kernels, passing it through a hyperbolic tangent nonlinearity after a bias, you get those six feature maps here, each of which kind of activates for a different type of feature. So, for example, uh, the feature map at the top here uh, turns on when there is some sort of horizontal edge. Uh, this guy here turns on whenever there is a vertical edge, okay? And those convolution kernels have been learned through backprop. The, the thing has been just trained with, uh, with backprop, not set by hand. They set, you know, randomly initially. So you see this notion of equivariance here. If I, uh, if I shift the input image, the activations on the feature maps uh, shift, but otherwise stay unchanged, all right? That's shift equivariance. Okay, and then we go to the pooling operation. So this first feature map here corresponds to a pooling, a pooled version of this first one, the second one to the second one, third one to the third one. And the pooling operation here, again, is an average, then a bias, then a sigmoid nonlinearity. And so if this map shifts by 
uh, one pixel, this map will shift by one half pixel. Okay? So you still have equivalence, but, you know, shifts are reduced by, uh, you know, a factor of, of two, essentially. Okay, and then you have the second stage where each of those maps here is a result of doing a convolution on each or a subset of the previous maps with different kernels, summing up the result, passing the result to a, a sigmoid. And so you get those kind of abstract features uh, uh, here that are kind of a little hard to interpret visually, but it's still equivalent to shift. Okay, and then again, you do pooling and, and subsampling. So the pooling also has, you know, this tried by a factor of two. So what you get here are, are maps so that those maps shift by one quarter pixel if the input shifts by one pixel. Okay, so you reduce the shift and it becomes, you know, might become easier and easier for following layers to kind of interpret what the shape is because you exchange uh, spatial resolution for uh, feature type resolution. You increase the number of feature types as you go up the layers. The spatial resolution goes down because of the pooling and subsampling, but the number of feature maps increases and so you make the representation a little more abstract, but less sensitive to shifts and distortions. And the next layer, uh, again, performs convolutions, but now the size of the convolution kernel is equal to the height of the image. And so what you get is a single band uh, for this feature map. It's basically, it becomes one dimensional. And so now the, any vertical shift is basically eliminated, right? It's turned into some variation of activation, but it's not, uh, it's not a shift anymore. It's some sort of simpler, hopefully, uh, transformation of the input. In fact, you can show it's simpler. Um, it's flatter uh, in some ways. Okay, so that's the, the sort of generic uh, convolutional net architecture where you have, uh, this is a slightly more modern version of it, where you have some form of normalization, uh, batch norm, uh, group norm, whatever. The filter bank, that's, those are the multiple convolutions. Uh, in signal processing, they're called filter banks. Uh, a point where there's non-linearity, generally a ReLU, and then some pooling, generally max pooling, okay, in the most common imp uh, implementations of convolutional nets. You could, of course, imagine other types of pooling. I talked about the average, but the more generic version is the LP norm, uh, which is... Uh, uh, you know, take all the inputs to a complex cell, elevate them to some power, and then take the, you know, sum them up, and then take the, elevate that to one over the power. Uh, yeah, there should be a, a sum inside of the, of the piece root here. Um, another way to pool, and again, uh, you know, any pooling a good pooling operation is an operation that is invariant to the to a, a permutation of the input. It gives you the same result, regardless of the order in which you put the input. Here's another example. We talked about this function before. One over b log sum over inputs of e to the b x exponential b x. Again, that's a kind of symmetric aggregation operation that you can use. So that's kind of a stage of a convolutional net, and then you can repeat that. Um, there's sort of various ways of uh, positioning the normalization. Some people put it after the nonlinearity, before the pooling, you know, it depends. But it's typical. So how do you do this in PyTorch? Uh, there's a number of different ways you can do it by, you know, writing it explicitly, writing a class. So this is a example of a convolutional net class, a uh, particular one here, where you do uh, convolutions, ReLU, and, and, uh, and uh, max pooling. Okay, so the constructor here creates convolutions, convolution layers which have parameters in them. Uh, and this one uh, has what's called fully connected layers. I hate that, okay? Um, so there is this idea somehow that the, the last layer of a convolutional net like, uh, like this one is fully connected because uh, every unit in this layer is connected to every unit in that layer. So that looks like a full connection. But it's actually useful to think of it as a convolution. Okay? Now, for efficiency reasons or maybe some other bad reasons, they're called 
you know, fully connected layers. They, and we use the class linear here. But it kind of breaks the whole idea that your network is a convolutional network. So it's much better, actually, to view them as convolutions. In this case, one-by-one one convolutions, which is sort of a weird concept. OK, so here we have uh, four layers, two convolutional layers, and two so-called fully connected layers. Um, and then the way we, uh, so we need to create them in the constructor, and the way we uh, use them in the forward pass is that, uh, you know, we do a convolution of the input, and then we apply the ReLU, and then we do max pooling, and then we uh, run the second layer and apply the ReLU and do max pooling again, and then we reshape the output because we, it's a fully connected uh, layer, so we want to make this a, a vector, so that's what the x view minus 1 does, uh, and then apply a, a ReLU to it, um, and, uh, you know, and this, the second uh, fully connected layer, and then apply a softmax if we want to do classification. And so this is somewhat similar to the architecture you see at the bottom. Uh, the numbers might be different in terms of, you know, feature maps and stuff, but, um, but the general architecture is, uh, is, is pretty much what we're talking about. Yes? Uh, what will be the filters of the convolutional layer? Say again? You know, whatever gradient descent decides. Um, we can look at them, but um, if you train with a lot of uh, examples on natural images, the kind of filters you will see at the first layer basically will end up being mostly oriented edge detectors, very much similar to what people, to what uh, neuroscientists uh, observe in, uh, in the cortex of uh, animals, in the visual cortex of animals. They will change when you train the model. That's the whole point. Yes. Okay, so it's pretty simple. Here's another way of defining those. This is, uh, I guess it's kind of a outdated way of doing it, right? Not many people do this anymore. But it's kind of a simple way also. There is this class in, in PyTorch called NN Sequential. And... It's basically a container, and you keep putting modules in it, and it just, you know, automatically kind of use them as being kind of connected in sequence, right? And so then you just have to call, uh, uh, you know, forward on it, and 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 it will just uh, it will just compute the right thing. Uh, in this particular form here, you 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 pass it kind of a, a bunch of pairs. It's like a, a dictionary, so you you can give a name to each of the layers and you can later kind of uh, uh, access them. It's the same architecture we were talking about earlier. Yeah. I mean, the, the backdrop is automatic, right? You, you get it by default. You just call backward, and it knows how to backpropagate to it. Well, the class kind of encapsulates everything into, you know, into an object, you know, where the parameters are. There's a particular way of sort of, you know, uh, getting the parameters out and and kind of feeding them to you know, feeding them to an optimizer, and so the optimizer doesn't need to know what your network looks like. It just knows that there is a function and there is a bunch of parameters, and it gets a gradient, and you know it doesn't need to know what your network looks like. Um, yeah, you'll 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 hear more about this uh, tomorrow. Um, Okay, um, so here's a really interesting aspect of convolutional nets, and it's one of the reasons why they've, why they've become so uh, successful in, in many applications. It's the fact that uh, if you view every layer in a convolutional net as a convolution, so there is no full connection, so to speak, uh, you don't need to have a fixed size input. You can vary the size of the input, and the network will vary its size accordingly. 
Because when you apply a convolution to an image, you feed it an image of a certain size, you do a convolution with a kernel, you get an image whose size is you know, related to the size of the input, but you can change the size of the input and it just changes the size of the output. And this is true for every convolution, every convolutional-like operation, right? So if your network is composed only of convolutions, then it doesn't matter what the size of the input is. It's going to go through the network, and the, the size of every layer will change according to the size of the input, and the size of the output will also change accordingly. So here is a little example here where, uh, you know, I want to do uh, cursive handwriting recognition, and it's very hard because... Uh, I don't know where the letters are, so I can't, you know, just have a character recognizer that, uh, I mean, a system that will first cut the word into into letters, because I don't know where the letter, letters are, and then apply the convolutional net to each of the letters. So the best I can do is take the convolutional net and swipe it over the input, and then record the output. Okay? And so you would think that to do this, you would have to take a convolutional net like this that has a window large enough to see a single character, okay? And then you take your input image and you compute your neural net, your convolutional net at every location, shifting it by one pixel or two pixels or four pixels or something like this. You know, a small enough number of pixels that uh, regardless of where the character uh, occurs in the input, you will still get a score on the output whenever it needs to recognize one. But it turns out that would be extremely wasteful. Um, because uh, you will be redoing the same computation multiple times. And so the proper way to do this, and this is very important to understand, is that you don't do what I just described, where you have a small convolutional net that you apply to every window. What you do is you take a large input, and you apply the convolutions to, uh, to the input image. Since it's larger, you're going to get a larger output. You apply the second layer convolution to that, or the pooling, whatever it is. You're going to get a larger input again, et cetera, all the way to the top. And whereas in the original design you were getting only one output, now you're going to get multiple outputs because, you know, it's a convolutional layer. This is super important because uh, this way of applying a convolutional net with a sliding window is much, much, much cheaper than recomputing the convolutional net at every location. Okay? You, didn't be, you would not believe how many decades it took to convince people that this was a good thing. Um, so here's an example of how you can use this. This is a... This is a convolutional net that was trained on individual digits, 32 by 32. It was trained on NNIST, okay? 32 by 32 input windows. Uh, it's LUNET 5, so it's very similar to the architecture I just showed the code for, okay? It's trained on individual characters to just classify uh, the character in the center of the image. And the way it was trained is that there was a little bit of data augmentation where the character in the center was kind of shifted a little bit in various locations, changed in size. And then there were two other characters, you know, kind of, to, that was kind of added to the side to confuse it, okay, in many samples. And then it was also trained with the 11th category, which was none of the above, and the way it's trained is either you show it a blank image, or you show it an image where there is no character in the center, but there are characters on the side, okay, so that it would detect when it, whenever it's in between two characters. And then you do this thing of, you know, computing the convolutional net at every location on the input without actually shifting the convolutional net, but just applying the convolutions to the entire image. Uh, and that's what you get. So, so here, uh, the input image is 64 by 32, even though the network was trained on 32 by 32 with those kind of generated examples. And what you see is the activity of some of the layers here. Not all of them are represented. And what you see at the top here are those kind of funny shapes um, you see threes and fives popping up, and they basically are the, an indication of the winning category for every location, right? So uh, the, 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 eight, the eight outputs that you see at the top are uh, basically the output corresponding to eight different uh, positions 
of the 32 by 32 input window on the input, shifted by four pixels every time. And what is represented is the winning category within that window, and the grayscale indicates the score, okay? So what you see is, you know, there's two detectors detecting the five until the three kind of starts overlapping, and then two detectors detecting the three that kind of move around, um, because, you know, within a 32 by 32 window, a three appears to the left of that 32 by 32 window, and then to the right of that other 32 by 32 window shifted by four, and so those two detectors detect uh, that three or that five. So then what you do is you take all those uh, scores here at the top and you do a little bit of post-processing, very simple, and you figure out it's a 3 and a 5. And what's interesting about this is that uh, you don't need to do prior segmentation. So something that people had to do uh, before in computer vision was if you wanted to recognize an object, you had to separate the object from its background because the recognition system you know, would get confused by, uh, by the background. But here, with this convolutional net, it's been trained with overlapping characters, and it knows how to tell them apart, and so uh, it's not confused by characters that overlap. I have a whole bunch of those on my web website, by the way, those animations from the early 90s. Was it easy to find out what's the background and what has to become classified? What do you mean? Like, um, you said that earlier they used to separate the, the digits from the background, so yeah. it doesn't mean it's easy for, like, suppose you have a stop sign, is it? Earlier, was it that easy task to drop out the stop sign for the rest of the picture? No, that, that was the main issue. Uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, you know, com um, computer vision wasn't working very well. It's, it's because the very problem of uh, figure ground separation, detecting an object uh, and recognizing it is the same. You can't recognize the object until you segment it, but you can't segment it until you recognize it. It's the same for cursive handwriting recognition, right? You can't, um, so here's an example. Uh, do we have pens? It doesn't look like we have pens, right? Oh, here we go. That's true. I'm sorry. Maybe I should use the, if this works. Oh, of course. Okay. Can you guys read this? <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, it's horrible handwriting, but it's also because, you know, I'm writing on the screen. Okay, now can you read it? Minimum, yeah. Okay, this is absolutely you no know, way you can segment the letters out of this, right? I mean, it's kind of a random number of waves. But just the fact that the two I's are identified then is basically non-ambiguous, at least in English. Um, so that's a good example of, you know, the interpretation of individual uh, objects, you know, depending on their context. And what you need is some sort of high-level language model to know what words are possible. If you don't know English or similar languages that have the same word, there's no way you can, you can read this. Um, spoken language is very similar to this. So we, uh, all of you who have had the experience of learning a foreign language probably have the experience that uh, you have a hard time segmenting words from a new language and then recognizing the words because you don't have the vocabulary. Right. So if I speak in French, si je commence à parler français, vous n'avez aucune idée où sont les limites des mots, except if you speak French. So I spoke a sentence, it's words, but you can't tell the boundary between the words, right? Because there is basically no clear seizure between the words, unless you know what the words are in advance, right? So that's the problem of segmentation. You can't recognize until the segment. You can't segment until you recognize. You have to do both at the same time. And, you know, early computer vision systems had a really, really hard time doing this. So that, that's why, you know, this, this kind of stuff is big progress because you don't have to do segmentation in advance. It just, uh, 
just train your system to be robust to kind of overlapping objects and things like that. Yes, in the back. Is there a background class added to this model? Yes, there is a background class. So when you see a blank response, uh, it means the system says none of the above, basically, right? So it's been trained uh, to produce none of the above, either when the input is blank or when there is one character that's too, uh, you know, outside of the center, or when you have two characters, but there's nothing in the center, or when you have two characters that overlap, but there is no central character, right? So it's, you know, trained to detect boundaries between characters, essentially. Here's another example. So this uh, this is uh, th this is a, an example that shows that even a very simple convolutional net with just two stages, right? Convolution pooling, convolution pooling, and then two layers of uh, uh, you know two more layers afterwards uh, can solve what's called the feature binding problem. So visual neuroscientists and computer vision people had the the issue. It was it was kind of a puzzle. How is it that we perceive objects as objects. You know, objects are collections of features, but how do we bind all the features together of an object to form this object? Uh, is there some kind of magical way of doing this? And, and they did, you know, uh, psychologists did experiments like, uh, you know, draw this and then that. And you perceive the, the bar as a single bar because you're used to bars being, you know, obstructed by, occluded by other objects. And so you just assume it's an occlusion. Um, and then there are experiments that, you know, figure out, like, how much do I have to uh, shift the two bars where, to kind of make me perceive them as two separate bars. Um, but in fact, you know, they may not be perfectly aligned. And if you, if you do this... Uh, they may, be, you know, may be exactly identical to what you see here, but, but now you perceive them as two different objects. So, you know, how, how is it that uh, we do the, we seem to be solving the, the feature binding problem? And what this shows is that you don't need any specific mechanism for it, it just happens. If you have enough nonlinearities and you train with enough data, then as a side effect, you get the system that solves the feature binding problem without any particular mechanism for it. <laughs> so here you have uh, two shapes, and you move a single uh, uh, st uh, stroke, and you know it goes from a six and a one to a three to a five and a one to a seven and a three, um, etc. Right. Good question. So the question is, uh, how do you distinguish uh, between the two situations where you have two fives next to each other and the fact that you have a single five being detected by two different frames, right? Two different framing of, of that five. Well, there is this explicit training so that when you have two characters that are touching and none of them is really centered, you train the system to say none of the above, right? So it's, uh, it's always going to have, you know, five blank five. It's, all, it's always going to have even like one blank one, and the ones can be very close. It will, it will tell you the difference. Okay, so what, what are convnets good for? Um, uh, yes. Uh, I had a doubt in the last slide. Uh, so uh, when, when training the network to predict the sequence of digits, how was the output layer taken care of? Like, uh, were the number of neurons in the output changed? Or how was the output layer able to cater to the large number of feature maps that were produced by the increased feature size? Okay, so what you have to look at is this. So every layer here is a convolution, okay? Including the last layer. So it looks like a full connection because every unit in the second last layer goes into the output. But in fact, it is a convolution. It just happens to be applied to a single location. So now imagine that this layer at the top here now is bigger, okay, which is represented here, okay? Now the size of the kernel is the size of the image you had uh, here previously, but now it's a convolution that has multiple locations, right? And so what you get is multiple outputs. So we have multiple uh, copies of the output layer. That's right. Okay. 
That's right. Each of which corresponds to you know, a classification over a, an input window of size 32 by 32 in the example I showed. Uh, and those, those windows are shifted by, by four pixels, the reason being that the, the network architecture I showed uh, here has uh, convolution with stride one, then pooling with stride two, convolution with stride one, pooling with stride two, and so the overall uh, stride is four, right? And so um, to get a new output, you need to shift the input window by four uh, to, uh, to, get, to get one of those because of the, the two pooling layers with... Uh, uh, maybe I should be a little more explicit about this. Let me draw a picture that would be clearer. So, so you have an input. Like this. You do a convolution, let's say, a convolution of size 3. Okay, yeah, it's tried 1. Okay, I'm not going to draw all of them. Then you have pooling with subsampling of size 2. So you pool over 2 and you subsample, the stride is 2, so you shift by 2. No overlap. Okay, so here the input is this size, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, because the convolution is of size 3, you get an output here of size 6. And then when you do pooling with subsampling of, with stride 2, you get three outputs because you, that divides the output by 2. Okay, uh, let me add another one, actually 2. Okay, so now the output is 10. Uh, this guy is 8. This guy is 4. I can do convolutions now, also. Let's say 3. I only get, a, I only get two outputs. Okay. Oops. Hmm, not sure why it doesn't draw. doesn't want to draw anymore. That's interesting. Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> it doesn't react to clicks, that's interesting. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on. Oh, Sean is not responding. All right. I guess it crashed on me. Um well, that's annoying. Yeah, it definitely crashed. And of course, you forgot it, so... Okay, so we had 10, then 8. Um, because of uh, convolution with 3, then we have pooling uh, of size 2 with uh, uh, stride 2, so we get 4. Uh, then we have convolution with 3, so we get 2. Okay, and then uh, maybe pooling again. Uh, size 2 and subsampling 2, we get 1. Okay, so 10 input. Eight, four, two, um, and then one for the pooling. Uh, this is convolution three, you're right. This is two. And those are three, etc. Right, now let's assume I, I add a few units here. Okay, so that's going to add, let's say, four units here, two units here, uh, then uh, yeah, this one is like this and like that, so I got four, 
and I got another one here. Okay, so now I had I had only one output, and by adding four uh, four inputs here, uh, which is now fourteen, I got two outputs. Why four? Because I have two stride of two. Okay, so the overall subsampling ratio from input to output is four. It's two by two times two. So now this is uh, twelve, and this is six, and this is four. So that's a, you know, a, a demonstration of the fact that you, know, you can increase the size of the input, it will increase the size of every layer, and if you have a layer that has size one and the, it's a convolutional layer, the, its size is going to be increased. Yes? Change the size of the letter. Uh, like vertically, horizontally? Yeah, so there's going to be... Uh, so first you have to train for it. If you want the system to have some invariance to size, you have to train it with characters of various sizes. You can do this with data augmentation if, you're, if your characters are normalized. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing is, uh, empirically, simple convolutional nets are only invariant to size to within a factor of relatively small factor. Like you can increase the size by you know, maybe 40% or something. I mean, change the size by 40%, plus minus 20% or something like that, right? Uh, beyond that, you, you know, you might have kind of more trouble getting invariance. But people have trained with, like, you know, input, input uh, I mean, objects of, of sizes that vary by a lot. So the way to handle this is, um, if you want to handle variable size, is that if you have an image and you don't know what size the objects are that are in this image, you apply your convolutional net to that image, and then you take the same image, reduce it by a factor of two, just scale the image by a factor of two, run the same convolutional net on that new image, and then reduce it by a factor of two again and run the same convolutional net again on that image. Okay? So the first convolutional net will be able to detect small objects within the image. So let's say your network has been trained to detect objects of size I don't know, 20 pixels, like faces, for example, right? There are 20 pixels. It will detect uh, faces that are roughly 20 pixels within this image. And then when you set sample by a factor of two and you apply the same network, it will detect faces that are 20 pixels within the new image, which means there were 40 pixels in the original image, okay? Which the first network will not see because, you know, the face would be bigger than its input window. Um, and then the next network over will detect faces that are 80 pixels, et cetera, right? So then by kind of combining the scores from all of those and doing something called non-maximum suppression, you can actually do detection and localization of objects. People use considerably more sophisticated techniques for detection now and for localization that we'll talk about next week. But that's the basic idea. So uh, let me conclude. Um, what are uh, convnets good for? They're good for signals that come to you in the form of a multidimensional array. But that multidimensional array has um, to have uh, two characteristics at least. The first one is there is strong local correlations uh, between values. So if you take a, an image, random image, take two pixels within this image, two pixels that are nearby, those two pixels are very likely to have very similar colors. Okay? Take a picture of this class, for example, two pixels on the wall basically have the same color. Okay, it looks like there is a ton of object here, but animate objects. But um, in fact, mostly statistically, neighbor, neighboring pixels are essentially the same color. Um, as you move the distance from two pixels away, and you compute the statistics of how similar pixels are as a function of distance, they're less and less similar. So what does that mean? Is because uh, nearby pixels are likely to have similar colors. That means that when you take a patch of pixels, say 5x5 five five or 8x8 eight eight or something, the type of patch you're going to observe is very likely to be kind of a smoothly varying uh, color, or maybe with an edge. But among all the possible combinations of 25 pixels, the ones that you actually observe in natural images is a tiny subset. What that means is that it's advantageous to represent the content of that patch 
by a vector with perhaps less than 25 values that represent the content of that patch. Is there an edge? Is it uniform? What color is it? You know, things like that, right? And that's basically what the convolutions in the first layer of a convolutional net are doing. Okay, so if you have, if you have local correlations, there is an advantage in dete detecting local features. That's what we observe in the brain. That's what convolutional nets are doing. Uh, it's the idea of locality. If you feed a convolutional net with permuted pixels, it's not going to be able to do a good job at recognizing your image, images, even if the permutation is fixed. Right. A fully connected net doesn't care about permutations. Um, then the second characteristic is that uh, features that are important may appear anywhere on the image. So that's what justifies shared weights. Okay, the co local correlation justifies local connections. The, the fact that features can appear anywhere, that the statistics of images or the signal is uniform, uh, means that you need to have repeated feature detectors for every location. And that's where shared weights uh, come into play. It also justifies the pooling as well. It does justify the pooling because uh, the pooling is if you want invariance to variations in the location of those characteristic features. And so if the objects you're trying to recognize don't change their nature by kind of being slightly distorted, then you want pooling. Um, so people have used ComNet for all kinds of stuff, uh, image, video, uh, text, uh, speech. So speech actually is pretty, speech recognition ComNets are used a lot. Uh, time series prediction, you know, things like that. And, you know, biomedical image analysis. So if you want to, you know, analyze an MRI, uh, for example, MRI or a CT scan is a 3D image. Uh, as humans, we can't, because we don't have a good visualization technology, we can't really apprehend, like, you know, understand a kind of a 3D volume, a 3D dimensional image. But a ComNet is fine. You know, we feed it a 3D image and it will deal with it. That's a big advantage because you don't have to go through slices to kind of figure out uh, the object in the image. Um, and then the last thing here at the bottom, I don't know if you guys know what hyperspectral image, images are. So a hyperspectral image is an image where, you know, most natural color images, I mean, Images that you collect with a normal camera, you get three color components, RGB. Uh, but we can build cameras with way more uh, spectral bands than this. And uh, that's particularly the case for satellite imaging where some uh, uh, cameras have many, many spectral bands going from infrared to ultraviolet. And that gives you a lot of information about what you're seeing in each pixel. Uh, some tiny animals that have small brains find it easier to process hyperspectral images of low resolution than high resolution images with just three colors. Uh, for example, the, this particular type of shrimp, right? They have those beautiful eyes and they have like 17 spectral bands or something, but super low resolution and they have a tiny brain to process it. Okay, that's all for today. See you.